Hello, welcome to Verbling. I am Teacher Oakley. Hello. Uh, for the next four days, starting today at this time slot here on Verbling, we are going to be learning how to and lots of practicing uh, speaking for the IELTS uh, standardized exam. Today's class uh, will serve as an introduction. I'll be giving some basic tips, my 10 tips list, which I myself have compiled, what I think are the 10 most important points. I'll be sharing that with you, as well as talking a good deal about the scoring. Uh, and we'll start out talking about the format of the test itself. And uh, anyway, today's class will serve as an introduction. And then um, tomorrow's class will concentrate on part one, the next day's class, part two, the next day's class, part three, like that. Lots and lots and lots of practice. So I hope you can join me for the whole series. Anywho, let me welcome students to the class and a little microphone check as well. Uh, hello, Mustafa. How are you today? Hello, I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Good to see you. Okay. Good to see you too. Uh, and also Salwa. Hello, Salwa. How are you? Salwa? Uh oh. Salwa, hello? Oh, Salwa, I can't hear you. So I don't know. You're gonna have Can to. Can hear you now? Oh, there we go. Then you got it. Yep. Play. Great. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> okay. Hope you can stay connected. Let me also welcome Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. I'm just a. Uh, mm, Got up, so. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Uh, also, Carolina has joined us. Hi, Carolina. Hello, Hi, teacher. Carol. Hello. Welcome to the class, and welcome V. Hi, V. Hi. Hi there. Okay. Um, to start Can out you with. Hear me now? Yeah. There you go. Hi, Soma. It's better. Hi. Thanks for the uh, lessons. I it's on time. I'm preparing for my IELTS exam, and I struggle in this part specific, especially. Oh. So thanks for your lesson. Okay, you're very very welcome. And uh, great. Don't be shy about asking me questions, and that goes for everyone, not just Sawa. Um, today, uh, you know, uh, I, I want to talk to you about your IELTS experience a little bit, but also I'm going to be doing a lot of frankly, lecture. So uh, you really help me out if you would ask me questions, you guys, anything, whatever. Um, and really, feel free to ask me questions. Not, not. I know the topic is IELTS speaking, but you guys have questions about other areas of the test, comparing to TOEFL, ah, whatever. Um, okay. Uh, Natasha has also joined us. Hi, Natasha. Yes. Yes, hello. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, and Roberto. Hello, Roberto. Hi, Ted. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the class. Uh, okay, I just uh, I'm going to go around and talk to you guys all uh, just a, a little bit. Actually, it might help me to know what points I, I need to to bring up with you guys. Because uh, I want to hear about your IELTS experience or no experience or uh, plans or whatever. Mustafa, starting with you, I can't remember. Did you take the IELTS test? No, nope. I haven't nope. taken it yet. Yet is the yet, yeah. the, the operative yeah. word is yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you yes. have plans. Mm, who's no? Yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> if I have like a, yeah, if I have a chance, I will uh, give it a shot. Okay, well, it costs money. Eyeless, That's one, one yeah, reason. Eyeless and also TOEFL as well. Okay, all right. 
how far out? You don't. You have no def definite plans at this time. No, nope, no, nope. I okay. don't have any definite plans because you know when you want to complete like, uh, for example, if you wanna, I think if you wanna study maybe or complete like after the bachelor degree, you want to complete your studying. I think you have to take uh, IELTS exam in order to to go to the university or to join university, especially if it was like outside of your country. So I think it's yeah. required, something required. Yeah, that's why a lot of people take the IELTS exam is because they're going to university in a different country. Absolutely. Yeah. And as, okay, you have no definitive plans, but this is why I wanted to talk to you guys because it helps me remember points. My recommendation, totally my opinion, you can disregard it or, or take my opinion as you see fit. Uh, in my opinion, if you are, think about your, like, your verbling rating, verbling classes, or which works on the European model, the, the um, A, B, C, uh, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2 learners, or another way, are, are you elementary or beginner, are you intermediate, are you advanced? My opinion, if you're an advanced student, even if you're an advanced student, you should spend three months of preparation time for the IELTS. If you're an intermediate student, you need at least six months for IELTS or TOEFL. Studying specifically IELTS and TOEFL, I'm not talking about studying English in general because I'm a native speaker. I'm an English teacher. I took the IELTS exam, and the first time I took it, I had a good score. All right, I'm you know, I had a good score, but I did not have a perfect score. There was a, definitely room for improvement, and then I studied. I took a course for 64 hours of classroom time, not to mention my own study time, in order to get the score m more suitable for an English teacher, shall we say. Okay, so the point here is, yes, it's English, but it's a lot more than English. There's a lot of strategy and test-taking strategy that that has to be learned and you have to learn what they're looking for what IELTS is looking for in the IELTS test what TOEFL is looking on the TOEFL test is slightly different many of the similarities many of the same things but not exactly you have to give the answers how they want them not necessarily just English but you have to address their scoring let me talk to others. Okay, Sawa, you, when are you taking the test? After 15 days, but I took um, TOEFL exam before, from two years. But okay. I'm not uh, about to get a good score. I get only uh, 71 in IELTS, uh, in TOEFL. But TOEFL. Uh, in, mm, yeah, uh, uh, IELTS, I'm seeking to get uh, about band 7 for high. Band seven. Yeah, I just finished my uh, master's degree. For so I'm looking for a PhD uh, degree abroad, so, so I'm, I need the high score. Okay. Well, okay, you're okay. It's important, everybody. You have to have a goal. You really do. Okay, you have a goal of seven. Um, okay, that's reachable. You can do that. Uh, you got a 71 in TOEFL. That's that's like I don't know 5.5 or 6 in IELTS. So you're you're going uh, you're aiming up, and that's good. But it's definitely possible for you. Um, just okay. A, a word about the scoring. We're gonna say a lot more words about the scoring later. But she mentioned if you don't know the IELTS is uh, scored by what they call band scores starting at zero, which is impossible to get a zero. If you don't show up to the exam, then you get a zero. Um, and then it goes, generally we talk about bands, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is a perfect score, uh, top score. They also score in IELTS in increments of 0.5. So 5.5, 6.5, these are normal scores. The IELTS scoring really, works like a bell curve, all right? Where the top of the bell, m most people um, get
get a six, basically. And then as you fall off the top of the bell, 5.5, 6.5, 7, you know, 5 over here, 4, 8, 3, 9. Not very many people get a 3 or less, and not very many people get a 9. Very small percentage. So it kind of works like that bell curve thing, where you, you've got like 5.5, 6, 6.5. That's like 50% of all the people who take the test get a score in that range or more. I think it's more, actually. Okay, anyway, I have to um, uh, give advice about uh, uh, pauses between talks. Like, um, uh, this is uh, lower the score, but I don't know how to get the right rate of it. You're trying to get rid of fillers. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. It's part of your delivery. Well, that is scored. We'll talk about that more later. But since we're talking about it now, let's talk about it now. Okay, that is difficult. Uh, a couple of strategies that I might advise you to try. One, and sometimes I do this, if I think I'm going to use a um or ah, I breathe in because you know what? I inhale because you know what? It's impossible to say um when you're inhaling. Um. <laughs> Well, you hurt yourself, okay? Take a little breath in, and that'll cause a little bit of a pause, but hopefully not noticeable. Your enemy in the IELTS test, or TOEFL, the worst thing you can do is dead air, uh, long pauses. That's, that's how you get a three or a four. Long pauses is the worst. Repetition is not good. Self-correction, a little bit is actually okay if you're self-correcting for material, uh, content, rather than grammar or verb tense or something like that, or preposition. A um, little self-correction is okay. There's one thing you might do. You might try breathing in a little bit to eliminate filler. Uh, another thing you can do is what I just did right there. Uh, you can stretch a vowel sound in order to keep going. Now, don't overuse it. You can do that a few times on the test, and that is acceptable native speaker like intonation we we do that when we're trying to like when we're giving directions and we're thinking well you go about a half a kilometer straight and then you're going to take uh, left we do that and that's acceptable but you can't do it through the whole test that's another strategy a few filler words mustafa to address your question uh, a few filler words are okay a few ums and ahs here and there you could still get a perfect score, but if you're doing it every single sentence, two or three times a sentence, you're, they're definitely going to score that for sure. Okay. Uh, I hope those help. Another one, Sawa, there is an organization. Oh, my God. What's it called? I forgot. Uh, ah, I can't remember. Uh, toast, toasters. Uh, I forgot what they're called now. Oh. Anyway, or, or uh, specific about IELTS? No, not not about IELTS. But I'm gonna. They they are an organization that gets together to practice public speaking. Okay, and one of the things they do, they take turns speaking in front of the group, their club, whatever. And one trick that they use to try to eliminate use of filler is they present some material, they give a speech in front of the people, and every time they say um, or uh, or ah, uh, or whatever, mm, they ring a bell. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Okay, sort of negative reinforcement, negative Pavlov's dogs kind of thing. Um, you might try that with, with a friend or family or somebody. You might try practicing where every time you say um or uh, they smack you with a book. <laughs> or 
they scream at you, ah! Every time you do it. I, I've actually done that with a student before, where I just screamed every single time they said um or ah. Uh. And we were actually practicing for IELTS. Uh, anyway, it worked. They, they used a lot of filler, this student. And... Uh, so I, you know, I said, okay, we got to do something. We tried a strategy. We tried another. And I just started screaming every time he used a filler. It worked, Sawa. You might try that one. That's a <laughs> radical approach. I don't know. Good luck. Let me know. Okay. Let me talk to some others here. Rebecca, have you had any experience with IELTS or TOEFL or any other standardized exam, CAE, whatever? Uh, well, and just ago... I I took um, what we call first, you know. First, do you know if familiar? Is, is it familiar to you? Which one is it again? Sorry. First, first. No. Like first, second. Well, it's famous here. Um, um, like yes. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I don't know. There's quite a few tests, and there's more and more competition for IELTS uh, and TOEFL. By the way, many countries and universities are accepting what's called the PTE. This is a Pearson Pearson Longman company. They make a lot of textbooks. Uh, they now have a test to compete with IELTS. Then there's the European system, the CAE, the FCE. Uh, yeah, you're right. There are a lot. It depends on the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In uh, Japan, um, they have what's called a TOEIC, T O E I C. So yeah, it depends. So you took it years ago, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe that. Okay. I believe the IELTS certification is good for two years. If I'm not mistaken. Um, for example, Carolina, how about you? Have you had any experience with any of these types of exams? Yes, teacher. Uh, two months ago, I took the IELTS test. Did you? Um, yes, I did. Um, on September 12th, I have to take another one. Aha! Another one. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well then, maybe next week I'll do another IELTS, but maybe I'll do reading or what do you guys want? You and Sawa, what do you want? What should I do next week? This week is speaking. Tell me now. You have a request? I think that I think that reading is 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 good, but listening are good too. So. Okay. All right. If you. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thank you. The trouble with reading uh, is the one matching headers and uh, um, about true false not given. This is the oh, part yeah. I always be. Oh teach. yeah. <laughs> Everybody, I can teach you a strategy for that, and I will, and, may, and maybe I will next week. Okay, Carolina. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do you want me to do? <laughs> By request. You want reading, uh, reading next week? I took general, not academic. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, if you told me strategies of listening, it could be better. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. I have to figure out what my schedule is and what classes and, you know, blah, 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 all that. But thank you. Ladies, both of you. Uh, Mustafa is asking about the parts of the test, and yeah, I'm getting to that in the whole format. Um, four parts. In the IELTS exam, uh, it's always the same order. One day, uh, one day, okay, let me, wait a minute, let me think here. Spe uh, no, no, no. Uh, list, what's first? Now I can't remember. I think listening <laughs> first. And then reading and then writing. Yes, 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 yes. First That's listening, it, right? then write, reading, and then writing. Right. Okay. And listening, reading, writing. In, 
it could be in the same day uh, speaking, or That's maybe right. two days after or two days later. Sometimes the speaking is separate. The those three, listening, reading, and writing, are always together. Sometimes speaking is separate. Sometimes, as Carolina points out, sometimes it's the same day, maybe even two hours later, whatever. Sometimes it's the next day. Sometimes it's the day before. It gets moved around because the the other parts of the test you take with a whole group of people, whatever, however many people in your group. I think there was 40 in my group, whatever. Carolina, how many people were in your group when you took the test? Uh, we were um, like 50. People. Yeah, okay. That's right, something like that. I think we were 45 or something. All right, right. And then the speaking test is one on one you and an interviewer, a live human being. Um, a big difference between IELTS and TOEFL. TOEFL, it's recorded. It's like this, a headset just like this with a microphone. And you're talking into a machine and everything's timed. In the IELTS speaking test, you're talking to a human being or a close approximation of a human being, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Not always quite human. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, Carolina, you can tell me, I, I don't know, but one of my, okay, I, I, as I told you, I took the IELTS test a couple of times. One time, I had this woman from Hong Kong, and she was like a stone. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite kind of music? Like, like she was like getting ready to send me to prison for um, the rest of my life or something. It was slightly scary. And the other guy was a very jovial Australian guy, a little bit of an mm -hmm. accent. Beware of that. You might be dealing with somebody with a little bit of an accent. But he was very friendly, and he did, he did little things like hand gestures. They're not supposed to do this, okay? They're not supposed to give you any kind of visual clues or anything like that, but he was giving me the head nod. Okay, yeah, keep going. All right. He wasn't speaking, but he was giving me visual clues. The woman from Hong Kong was like a statue. She didn't move whatsoever. Um, anyway, so beware of that. You, you're going to have different personalities because you are doing a live interview. There are different personalities. Some of them will let you talk, blah, 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 let you go. Some of them will say, okay, that's enough. Okay, next question. All right, that's enough. Next question. They, they, it feels like they're not allowing you to speak very much because they keep stopping you and interrupting you. I don't know. I can't find a real pattern. I think it's flip a coin. It's just the personality of the interviewer you happen to get. How is your interviewer? Carolina. Uh, my interviewer was a friendly woman. She has a, a strange accent. I, I can. She, she was not Australian or, or Britain or American. Maybe she's from South Africa, something like that. Oh boy. But, yeah, but she was really, really friendly. One of the things that uh, fi feel, me, fi feel, feel me uncomfortable was that, as you know, Colombian people, we talk a lot. So for us, <laughs> it's, it's too difficult to stop. And <laughs> when, when she, she asks me some question, uh, not the second part, maybe the first part or the third part, I start to talk a lot, and she say stop. And when she did that, I, my mind was blank because I feel that I am saying something wrong, but it's not. No. It's not because I am talking a lot. So. Good point. Good point for anybody taking this exam. If they stop you, they may even stop you a lot. Don't let that throw you off and go blank. You're not doing anything wrong. Actually, in a way, it's kind of a compliment. What they're trying to do, the whole idea of this exam, they are trying to 
get you to use as wide a range of vocabulary, grammar, sentence structure, uh, even intonation, um, pronunciation features, organizational features. They're trying to ask you questions to, okay, I want to hear you use past tense. I want to hear you use a conditional. I want to hear you use um, some modals of probability. They're, that's what they're focusing on. They could care less what you're actually saying. All right. Mm -hmm. So if they're stopping you, stopping you, stopping you, that that means it's an interviewer who's looking for like one thing. All right. I want to hear a future tense. Okay. Got it. Let's move on. Okay. I want to hear a modal. What would you like to do? What is a job that you might like to have in the future? I'm asking that not because I actually care about you. I'm asking you that because I want to hear a modal. So if right away you said, well, I've given it some thought before, actually, and I would really like to try being an airplane pilot. Okay, I would really like to try. Okay, it's got an adverb there, got a future tense. All right. Okay. I thought I might like to. So they'll stop you and, mm -hmm. and keep going. So it, that's all that means. You should not, you can't take it personally or make it make you nervous. Um, another thing that fit uh, feel me feel uh, something wait, weird wait, wait. is that yeah. no, just uh, hang on made me feel uncomfortable made, made me, me feel, feel weird yeah okay made Go me ahead. feel uncomfortable was that uh, it's only 12 minutes yeah. for you to demonstrate yeah. a lot of grammar a lot of um court is uh, a sentence coordinator, subordinator, everything else, subjunctive that is not enough time to to say a lot of things. So for yeah. me, the times happen too fast, and I feel that I didn't use a lot of uh, my vocabulary. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're stuck with the topics they give you. the The test is 12 to 14 minutes. I can, mm -hmm. and usually they try to hurry you up, so usually you're on closer to 12 minutes, as Carolina noted. Yeah. Um, yes, definitely. Just imagine the TOEFL exam, though. There you are, you have uh, four one-minute answers and two 45-second answers, so you're really only speaking for five and a half minutes total. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mustafa, you're asking, and I welcome questions from anybody. You can type them or say, excuse me, teacher, and ask me a question. Don't be shy. Mustafa is asking me um, a couple questions. Idioms. Yes, you should use idioms. Okay. Now, the way the IELTS following, follows exactly what Carolina and I were just discussing. They want to hear a range of things to do, and you don't have that much time. Okay. Yes, you should use idioms and phrasal verbs. It's conversational English. Absolutely. That's really the only way to get a nine. Okay. Um, but an interesting feature of the scoring in IELTS is this. Okay. Idioms is a great example. If you don't do it, in the vocabulary section of the scoring, or what they call lexical resource. Okay, if you don't ever use an idiom or a phrasal verb or any kind of an analogy, sorry, or metaphorical colloquial English, if you don't do it, <clears throat> you're going to be stuck with like a six, in, even if your vocabulary is perfect you won't get above a six in the vocabulary section. Now here's the interesting point about IELTS, and it's different from TOEFL. If you use an idiom and you get it wrong, all right, oh, it was raining, instead of saying it was raining cats and dogs, which is the idiom, you said it, it was raining ducks and geese, whatever. You get it wrong. Guess what? your vocabulary score goes up to a seven because you tried. IELTS will reward you for trying. You can get a better score by trying more things and making more mistakes. 
the IELTS exam, the way it's scored, you can make more mistakes and get a better score than playing it safe and only using simple sentences and vocabulary you absolutely know. You can actually get a better score by risking. It's worth risking it. If you get it right, then that 6 turned to a 7 becomes an 8. That's it. All over in the scoring, this phenomenon happens all over the place. Things like paraphrasing, doesn't paraphrase, you're this level, paraphrases badly, but is trying it, you go up a level. Mostly paraphrases correctly, okay, and paraphrases correctly whenever necessary. That's the way the scoring works in, in several different aspects. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's totally different from TOEFL. TOEFL, you should play it safe because anything wrong is wrong, and they want a very defined structure in TOEFL. You can do whatever you want in IELTS, and, and you should. Go crazy. Uh, okay, uh, V, let me talk to you for a minute. Have you... Uh, um, Hi. Have you had have you had any experience with the IELTS test or TOEFL or any other? Yes, I have with um, yeah. IELTS, maybe three years ago. But okay. um, yeah, after listening to your um, explanation, I think I I like the time for my preparation that time because I just uh, prepared uh, within three weeks for my IELTS test. Um, yeah. Yeah. That time, I I think I was in a hurry for in a hurry for my application to a company, so I just uh, gave it a try and uh, I didn't aim too much for my my score. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I got six for for that. Mm, I just wanna test want to test myself, so that's uh -huh. what I got. Yeah. Okay. Will you will you take the exam again in the future? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Mustafa has another question about time limit. Actually, there is no time limit. Well, kind of. There's three parts to the exam. Part one is um, four to five minutes. Uh, but for, they ask you as many questions as they can in four to five minutes. And then part two, you have a question which is written down with bullet points, and they give you a minute to prepare. You can use a pencil and paper to make notes, and you should. If there's another small piece of advice. You definitely should make notes. And then two minutes speaking time, but don't worry. Just keep speaking until... They stop you. So always, basically, if you you know you say three, four, five sentences and you're done, you're done. Then don't wait wait for them to to stop you. But like part two question where it's timed, make them stop you. Force them to stop you in part two uh, because they don't say it anywhere, but they most certainly do deduct points if you don't speak for two minutes. Okay, so part two, keep talking. And really, if, if, they, if you make them stop you every single time, that will not count against you at all. Um, you know, however, at some point it would be nice to show that you can do a conclusion. You know, speak a conclusion sentence using a conclusion signal word or signal phrase. That's, that would help your score, so, you know. Uh, okay. V, what was the hardest part of the test for you? Mm, I think uh, listening because, um, yeah, I, I was in a room and um, the surrounding uh, area very noisy that time. They maybe, um, they were on construction of a building, I think. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> I hardly <laughs> listened to anything, yeah. So, yeah. But my yeah. memory of that was terrible. 
because yeah. I couldn't listen and uh, for my speaking huh? um, because of my name and alphabet so I maybe I was the last person who take uh, mm. that speaking part and yeah. the teacher looks very tired I think maybe exhausted and um, he's also running nose nose running he was oh. nose running yeah and I think he, he looks so terrible, but he still tried to ask me. And um, because I have, I, I think I was not in the mood to say anything. So um, I got 6 or 6.5 for, for uh, my speaking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, that brings up another point. Actually, similar story, not to me, but to my students here in the Philippines where I live. They went to take the test, and here in the Philippines, all, all roofs, the roof, the ceiling, they're made of tin. That's normal. Um, and they went to take the listening test, and there was a heavy, heavy rain. So imagine, you know, tin roof, big building, all tin roof, lots of rain. They could barely even hear the listening test. Okay. What do you do? You you have to complain, but you have to formally complain, and you no, can. But no, I I couldn't because because of the time, they just yeah. played um, one, two times, two times I think, yeah, two times for listening. So I didn't have enough time to complete my test. So I don't think uh, complaining is a good idea. I just try to okay. finish. It. But you are allowed in these kinds of special circumstances. You, they may they may totally disregard your um, your complaint, or they may let you take the test again, or they may adjust your score. Oh really? Because uh, not only me, but the whole room. They they had to bear that situation. Not only me. Yes. In the situation that I described, they allowed everyone who took the test to take the test again oh, because okay. everyone did terrible. You know, <laughs> it, it was ridiculous. It was clear, clearly affected the outcome of the score. So they allowed everyone to take the test again. I, some people, I've had some students who complain, complain, ask for a review. Better than say complain. Really, they ask for a review. For example, of their speaking test. Now it's re recorded, and I don't know. I've experienced this. I've taught a lot of students IELTS, and maybe eight times, four of them adjusted the score, half a band score up. Four of them didn't change anything in one category: speaking or writing or whatever. So, you know. Maybe if you're a half a band score off and that's all you need, then you might want to try appealing there, there, appealing the score, asking for a review. You might get it. Okay. Well, just some advice, uh, Natasha. How about you? Have, have you ever yes, had any experience with? Yes, yeah, yes, I have had that experience. My exam, IELTS exam, uh, was uh, in the end of May, and uh, I I am going to try again, and it uh, will be it uh, this uh, uh, at the nearest Friday. When? This Friday? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> Omg! Oh wow! Yeah. Well, super good luck. Uh, thank you. you uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> do you feel like you're ready? I don't know. Sometimes I think so, but sometimes I really very, very nervous, and I think, oh, I can't do it. I can't. I don't know. I'm nervous, and uh, I'm really um, a little bit tired because I I'm prepared all this uh, summer. Yeah. Yeah. Get some rest. Okay. There's. Very stupid piece of advice, but believe me, I've had so many students do this. <laughs> Two things. Don't study the night before the test. D don't. Okay. Get, have a good, have a nice dinner, relax, watch a little TV, go to bed early. Also, eat breakfast. 
because that <laughs> is, that listening is that's really draining energy from your body. Um, you have to focus so intensely. You need to be rested and you need to be well fed. Really, you do. Okay. Because I've had several students who insist on cramming, studying late night, all night, at the last mm -hmm. minute, and it's it's, a, it's terrible, terrible strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Because uh, you need okay. so much focus to do this exam. It's it's really important. Um, the other thing is remember to bring your passport or whatever identifying documents they've asked you to bring. Make sure you have them ready to go the night before so you're not scrambling around looking for your passport. <laughs> or it's happened to my students, they get to the test center and then they realize, oh, I forgot my documents at home. And, they, <laughs> and then they're all panicking and their, their mind isn't really focused on what's going on. They're freaking out, running around. So, so get yourself okay. organized <laughs> by all means <laughs> and relax. We'll get to Thank that you. relaxing part in a minute. I got I'll some... try. All right. All right. Good luck, and I hope you can join me in the classes at this time all this week, or for the today and the next three days. We'll be doing a lot of practice. Yeah, I'm you, going to do it. I'll give you lots of pra time to practice, and I'll give you feedback, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Um, how yes. can I bring this uh, speaking part at home? Sorry, Sawa, once again, please. Just. How can I uh, practice speaking part at home and correct my mistakes? Best strategy uh -huh. for this. Uh, okay. It's difficult to do by yourself because you're not entirely sure if, if you're correcting if you're correcting correctly. You can try recording yourself. Um, you might try this, Sawa, go online to one of the, there's so many IELTS sites, pick one, just, you know, search IELTS speaking test, and go to one you don't even know, and just start answering the questions on the test, but record it, you know, and then play back, listen, see, see how you sound, do you sound... Is your delivery good? Do you, do you sound okay? See if you notice any mistakes. That may be one strategy. <coughs> Possibly. Um, Mustafa, last question. I know it's not really your last question. It's okay. What is this? Um, uh, okay. Vocabulary. All right. All right. Vocabulary. Uh, all right. Well, all right, I'm, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean in a second, but basically you want to use really what they love. Um, <coughs> it was a, okay, you can say it was a nice day, or you can say it was a beautiful day. That's a little better. It was a gorgeous day. That's a little even better. Um it was a totally gorgeous day. Well, if that's a co-location with an adverb, and that's like way better. Basically, more uh, unique um, vocabulary, less used but appropriate is better. But more important than, than just that is using co-locations, using the words that go together commonly in English. So your question is a little bit, tricky to answer. You want to use more sophisticated vocabulary and yet you want to sound like a native speaker co-locating that vocabulary with other words. Is that clear? Yeah, it's clear teacher. I'm just, I want to elaborate one point. You know, like for example, if I listen to a native speaker, native English speaker, and at the same time I listen to English learner who's maybe on advanced level, and they are same talking about maybe the same topic, the same subject. I can recognize easily if the, this is like the advanced level student because he uses maybe high high level English vocabulary. And it's a little bit hard 
maybe the English like language speaker, he, he can use like uh, maybe easy vocabulary and simple one and easy to understand that's commonly used maybe between people. But maybe this is a student because he learned an advanced level or he maybe, I don't know, he wants to show up or maybe this is what he, he learned. Yeah, so, well, uh, yeah, this is what I meant, teacher. I, I get your I, point. Well, yeah. the IELTS exam, you are trying to show off, actually. Oh, really? So the, the advanced level student would do better than the native speaker there. Mm -hmm. You are trying to show off. You're trying to show as many things that you can do as you possibly can. That's what um, you're there to do. Exactly, is show off. <laughs> so, so I can I can use like uncommonly words, like from maybe academic word or something like that. Sure, um, sure you can, but you can also use slang. You can also say, "Oh shoot, I I don't know. I've never thought about that question. Darn it!" You can do things like that in the test, and that sounds very natural. And that's also vocabulary. Okay, so cool. you don't have to say, oh, blast it, toothpicks and fingernails, oh my goodness, <laughs> whatever, you, you need to sound natural, so if you're using sophisticated language, you need to sound natural doing it, that's all, okay, that's the idea. Okay, uh, Roberto. How about yourself? Do you, have you had any experience with the IELTS or TOEFL or anything? Uh, no, teacher. I uh, only did an exam about uh, uh, level B1, I think. CAE? Or um, FCE? I don't know, teacher. I don't know the... Yeah. Okay. I, know. No, I only no, know level B1. No difference. No, B1, sorry, B1. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, frankly, doesn't matter because you, uh, uh, okay, they're all, well, a lot of these exams, by the way, are done by different companies, and, um, but a lot of them are done by the same company, that is to say, the British Council, um, University of Cambridge, Oxford, anyway, no matter. Okay, we've got a little over 10 minutes, so I want to share a couple things here, um, with this scoring, I also want to share my tips because these are great tips. <laughs> I'm very proud of these. Uh, I came up with these myself. All right. First, the tips. Let's run through these. I'm going to have you guys read them for me because I'm lazy. All right. Top 10 tips. Uh, okay. Uh, Mustafa, number one. And this is for you, Carolina. And okay. for you, Natasha. Go okay. ahead. Don't panic. The idea behind the test is to sound as much uh, as much like a native speaker as possible. If you are too tight, it will affect affect your delivery. Also, keep in mind nobody cares about your opinion, your show feeling, or your intelligence. They want to hear you delivery of English. Yeah. Don't, many people think they, oh, I don't want to talk about that. It's too boring. No, that doesn't matter. Many people think, oh, I don't want to say this. Everybody must say this. I should say something different to sound unique or to differentiate myself from other students. Not necessarily. Not really. Because if you say the same thing 50 other students said, but you say it better, that's going to differentiate you. So don't really worry about your content because nobody cares, honestly. It's, the content is a vehicle for the English spoken language. It's, it's not the other way around. In normal life, I know, you use the language as a vehicle to, to express your content and your meaning. But really, in the test, it's reverse. The content is the part that doesn't matter. Mm. You know, you know, teacher. Just one point to mention. Like, I believe that if you panic or or you lose, you let you let them get, get into your, get into your nerve. Okay, then you will lose everything. You cannot help yourself after that. Maybe you need, I don't know, half an hour to go back to your normal or relaxing way. Yeah, well, on your side. Yeah, you have to practice before the exam. 
and yes, you do. try to be calm as much as possible. Yeah, yeah breathe. Yeah, as Carolina said, you, you, something happens in the exam and your your mind goes blank. Um, it happens. Be aware of this. Maybe the interviewer stops you or says something, whatever. Another thing that can happen, which has thrown a couple of my previous students, they will bring out a topic. You can't study by topic. It's pointless. It's my opinion, but it's a very strongly held opinion because they constantly add topics to this exam. Constantly. They update it. They recycle old ones and make new questions, and there are something like 350 topics. There's no way you can kind of memorize answers for 350 topics with a base of questions of 100 questions for each one. That's ridiculous. However, don't panic if they say something to you like, um, what is the importance of birds in your country? That's one of my favorites that happened to an actual student of mine. They wanted to talk about birds, and he was a South Korean, and he birds don't mean diddly squat in, North, in South Korea. <laughs> they don't mean anything. They eat chicken, and that's it. Um, so he panicked, and he blew his test because that was the first topic in part one, and he just he choked, as we say in English. He completely choked. Ah! And then he could never get it back. Exactly what Mustafa was saying. Uh, so, uh, point number two is about number two. The magic number is to always give at least two supporting reasons or two conditions in your answer. This is to help ensure uh, that you provide enough details. Okay. You can't, at the time you're taking the test, be concerned over what preposition you're using and what verb tense I need to use and, and oh I already used that vocabulary word so I need a synonym you don't have time to think about that you do have time to think about points two and three okay I should say two things you can handle keeping that in your head as you're taking the test uh, okay number three Rebecca yeah, number three. Use this courses this course marks using subordinating adverbs and signal fra phrases will affect every aspect of the scoring positively. Besides the obvious effect of helping cohesion and coherence, it also affects delivery and intonation forces more complex sentence structure and adds. Whoops. Adds vocabulary. Oh, sorry. Adds vocabulary. Okay. Vocabulary. No, no problem. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, signal phrases. S signal. Signal phrases. Yeah, it's, this is a tricky word. Everyone messes this up because when it's without the suffix, it's sign and the G is silent. But then when it has the suffix, it, you pronounce the G. Signal. Uh, okay. okay, signal. All signal. Right. Thank you. Okay, all right. Now, this is pretty sophisticated language here. What do I mean by discourse markers, Rebecca? What am I talking about? Do you have any idea? Can you give me an example? Uh, is just playing me the word discourse. Maybe yeah. I can... Discourse. I can uh, give you an example. Discourse is basically talking. Uh, there, uh, yeah. there are, I can say this in about six different ways. Discourse marker, markers, signal phrases, transitionals, and connectives. Um, okay, different ways to say the same thing, really. What, do you know what I'm talking about? Met for example, uh, method, uh, metaphor. No, not exactly. Yeah. Things like when you're going to give your opinion, you say, in my opinion, blah, 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 blah. Uh, connection, connection words, or connection sentences. Yes, that's right. To connect your yeah. ideas. That's it. On the other hand, or there I, you go. That's it. That's that it. is my opinion, but uh, on the other hand, maybe some people could think blah, 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 something like that. 
Something very much like that. That's it. You got it. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Anytime you give an opinion, you need to use a signal phrase. Every reason you give, well, one important aspect is, um, and the, the more rule of thumb, of course, you can say firstly, secondly, finally. You, that's mm -hmm. better than nothing, but much better the more words you can add to these introductory phrases. Okay. Well, I think the first important point is that blah, 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 rather than just saying, firstly, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah. Another interesting aspect might be that blah, 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 blah. Okay. Again, remember to do this. Remember to talk about two things, and you'll be just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Really. This really does affect all four areas of scoring. Absolutely. And by doing this, you're forcing yourself to make more complex sentences, which really helps boost the grammar. We tend when when we use these phrases additionally, blah 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 blah. Surprisingly, blah 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 blah. We have to use more sophisticated intonation features as well. It, it really helps everything. I always encourage students to do this. Get in the habit of doing this all the time because it will pay. Really, this doing this is not just good in the IELTS test. This is good for organizing your speech in a presentation, in a job interview, um, for being clear if you're training somebody multiple, multiple reasons to try to develop your use of these connectives in English. It will make you more, it will make you more easily understood. It will, it will make you a better speaker, frankly. Uh, okay. Number four. Okay. Well, this one's for you, Mustafa. Uh, Carolina? Okay, teacher, keep talking. There is no penalty for talking too much. The interlocutor will simply stop you. However, there are very heavy penalties for talking too little. Absolutely. Okay, so we addressed this already earlier, talking to Mustafa about don't worry about talking too much. As I, as I said, there is no penalty for talking too much. It's not possible. V, number five. I understand the question. There are no penalties for asking questions to clarify. However, there are penalties for going off topic. Aha. Okay. So, it's okay to say, do you mean blah, 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 blah. So, should, would you like to... Would you like me to tell you about blah, 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 blah? It's okay to ask those questions. There's no penalties for asking those questions. If anything, the fact that you know how to properly form a question sentence in English is going to help your score. Uh, all right. Natasha, number six. Always answer why. You the uh, interrogatives. When, where, why, who, what to brainstorm your answer. Especially why. Why did you do that? Like that. Go there. Have that opinion. Okay. Um, if you don't know what content to have, you have problems brainstorming answers. Here is a strategy. Who, what, where, when, why? Who did I do it with? Where did I go? Why was I there? What was I doing? When did this happen? But most importantly, why on earth did I do that? Uh, okay, Roberto, number seven. Uh, these examples from your own experience. Although some questions seem quite general in nature, that is actually a trap. The IA LTS scoring depends on you providing detail and the easiest way to do that is to talk about yourself. Absolutely. You want to tell little stories or anecdotes, anecdotes about yourself? Go ahead. This is a trick. They ask extremely general questions in... It's a trap. It's a trick. The, 
relate that general question to you yourself and your personal experience so that you can give really specific detail uh, vocabulary and uh, and sentences okay it's easiest I don't care who you are language learners it's always easier to talk about yourself than to talk about things in general um, okay Mustafa number eight Okay, be aware of close-ending questions. You will be asked yes or no questions or questions which seem to have one direct answer. It's sharp. Try answering with, well, it depends. This forces you to think of two aspects or conditions of the topic. Straightforward strategy. Okay. Do you like ice cream? Well, it depends. On a really hot day, I enjoy to have some ice cream, but on a colder day, I don't really like it as much. Because on a hot day, blah, 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 blah. It helps you develop that two, that magic two aspects of the answer, and they will most certainly do that to you every time. They will ask you a very direct question. Uh, Salwa, number nine. Choose the best answer. The best answer is not the most exciting answer or even uh, the real life correct answer. The best answer is whatever you are you can talk uh, the most about. That's right. You may say things, give opinions that you actually don't even agree with, and that is perfectly normal and okay. In fact, that leaves us with number ten, Rebecca. Last one here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, number 10. Lie. Go ahead. Lie your face off. No one actually cares what you say, and no one is going to follow you home and fact check you. You can make up fake reference. Use your friend, friend's experience as you, your own, or give or, or give examples that are entirely made up. Absolutely. Yes. If, uh, it pays to be a good liar in this test. <laughs> really yeah, does. you know. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's actually a good strategy. Develop your lying skills. Um, okay, if you're not a good liar, then, you know, don't lie. All right, but if you're good at it, use it. Uh, okay, we are over time. I've got to go. Got a student waiting for me. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you.